Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, welcome uh, to my talk. Uh, I am Michal Kukni. I work at SUSE and I work on various stuff, various stuff related to C groups. And now I would like to delve into slightly to, into the recursive statistics framework. So, at the beginning, uh, I will try to explain to you who are not familiar with that so that uh, you get the idea and uh, you can join the discussions later. Uh, by the way, the, the original idea of our stats, uh, it's, uh, it's not my original, it's uh, the credits goes to other people, just to be clear. Uh, then I will present some theory I had about the behavior of RSTAT in certain situations, which I tried to verify with uh, some experiment. Uh, so I will describe that. And uh, the last part, which should be also a discussion part, uh, I would like to initiate some possible ideas. Uh, how can this be improved? So very short, uh, very short description of uh, uh, where you can encounter the RST framework is uh, basically uh, if you read from the uh, any of the .stat files in the C group, in C group directory. So uh, some of the fields are generated uh, by the, from are generated uh, from data received from the RST, RSTAT. Yes. So in general, there are two uh, two sides of of this framework uh, for the readers and for for the writers. Uh, the readers, I mentioned them. Uh, they are visible, for example, from the uh, user space uh, by the files. The writers are typically inside the kernel. Uh, the writers, I would sometimes I would, I will call them updaters. Uh, the readers, I will call them flushers. Uh, we will see soon why uh, this terminology. So uh, the writers, when they uh, have some update for the data related to a C group, so uh, here in the picture, we can see what actually gets modified. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are two C groups here. Uh, the circles, or, yeah, the, the circles uh, denote two C groups. Uh, at the top is the root C group, and uh, the, in the middle is a C group that, uh, that initiates the update. And uh, we have to mark the update happens on any C group that's uh, on the path from this particular uh, selected C group to the root. Uh, but we can see that it does not uh, does not uh, concern the subtree of the updated C group, for example. So uh, yeah, we basically the, the work somehow is proportional to the depth of the updated C group. Now, the for the readers, uh, the readers uh, come. Uh, or the reader, the read request comes from a certain C group in the middle of the tree here. We see that it's subtree, it's denoted with the dashed triangle. And uh, yeah, we assume that there were already some updates happening before. So there are these uh, paths leading from the various updaters uh, under the uh, under the subtree. And uh, we, we, we have to fetch the data from these updated C groups and uh, aggregate them uh, up to the tree to the requester. And uh, yeah, we can see here that actually we don't have to, uh, we, we, it does not spend the whole subtree, it's just the updated paths. And here the, the, amount, yeah, the, uh, the amount of work that potentially ha has, that potentially necessary to do uh, is proportional uh, to the subtree size because everything can be updated in the worst case and uh, also it's, What's relevant here is related also to the number of controllers because every controller can, every controller uh, can have some work with the aggregation. Yes, here um, is a slightly uh, yeah, the the green the green structures I had in the previous pictures are realized in a so-called update tree uh, and. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it forms the structure of the tree, but it's independent from the C group tree. Uh, here is the quick scheme, and uh, uh, the, on the update, we, uh, we extend this tree, and on the flash, we basically uh, dismantle the whole tree. And uh, what I wanted to point here in this slide is the uh, name of the structure. Uh, it's called C group start CPU, uh, which I was not which I was not uh, explicit before uh, on the purpose because 
everything what I mentioned uh, happens uh, in per CPU replicas. So the updaters uh, work ideally with just uh, their CPU data and only when we do the flush. So the flush happens actually uh, over all the CPUs uh, multiple times uh, so that we aggregate the global, global state of, of the statistics. Okay, so uh, this is basically what I said. Uh, updates are per CPU. Um, when we are flushing, so we, we are just concerned with the sub T of, of the C group that we are reading the data from, and even uh, if there are some passive C groups uh, with no updates, so we, we easily skip them because we work with the, just the update sub T. Uh, here, and here's an overview of the common updaters or the writers that currently exist in the kernel. So uh, one of them is that uh, was the first first use of uh, this framework was the, for the time uh, CPU time tracking that's used uh, directly in the CPU core. Uh, then it's also used for the tracking of the transfer data via the I/O controller, and uh, memory controller uses that as well for its various uh, counters. Uh, or, yeah, it's divided into state state counters, event counters, and other statistics. And also recently, uh, there is uh, it's now possible to initiate the update by calling the function, the existing functions in the uh, uh, in, in the C group code uh, via BPF KFunk framework. Uh, uh, then the readers. Uh, here I uh, put them into some categories. Uh, so in, uh, initially, I was talking about the user space available. Uh, files, uh, but there are also some internal consumers of the data. Uh, namely, uh, it's used by the memory management code uh, first uh, when on the default path, and also uh, in the write back part when it bases the calculations on, uh, when it needs the data. So it needs the memcg data for proper calculations of a distribution of a limit or yeah, the, for, for the digital thing. Uh, but uh, here, here uh, uh, I try to uh, somehow uh, put it into the two categories that uh, we have some imprecise uh, readers that ca are happy with imprecise result and readers that require precise result. Uh, but this is just my division. It's nothing, uh, nothing conventional. Uh, so I, I, I put the space readers into the imprecise uh, category together also with the working set uh, refold uh, calculations that currently use uh, some kind of asynchronous flushing. Uh, that I will talk about it later. So that it means that they have slightly outdated data, but uh, it seems that it's sufficient. And the, yeah, the precise readers, uh, the, they are yeah, uh, used in the reclaim code, the uh, write-back code, and also currently, uh, yeah, for the BPF support caps also uh, for the readers. Uh, yeah, one uh, interesting point is that when we remove C group, uh, we have to flush its data as well, so that we we keep the state of the uh, data consistent. Yes. Uh, so uh, that was the and it uh, the users. Uh, now, again, more to the internals of the implementation that uh, can come, uh, that can become a problem uh, or that can be relevant for the performance. So uh, I, I didn't mention any logs, but uh, there are a few of them. Uh, there is, for the updaters, uh, there is the per CPU spin log, uh, which basically uh, logs their, their CPU replica. Uh, but it's a take, the log is taken during the flushing as well uh, for, for the CPU replica that we are uh, flushing currently. Uh, then there is also the, a bigger log, uh, the CGroup airstat log, that's taken uh, during, the, uh, during the whole flush operation when we manipulate the, the update tree globally. And it depends on the context of the flusher. Uh, actually, uh, for example, the user space uh, the, the flush is initiated from the user space. Uh, they can even put uh, some contour skets into the flushing so that it uh, 
Yeah, because it, was, it means uh, it indicates that flushing is in, expected to take longer sometimes. Uh, and then there is a specialized lock uh, that used that's used only for the MCG flushing, because MCG adds some overlay on this framework. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah, then the problem uh, for the scalability is also uh, the callbacks of the individual controllers because it uh, depends how, how, mu how much data they have. So uh, it, can it can slow down the flushing as well. And uh, yeah, the time accounting that's uh, there from the beginning and the BPF callbacks, uh, so that's freshly, it's, I think it's just in BPF next three now, uh, but it uh, gives like opportunity to run the PPF code inside the flusher, so we can see uh, yeah, uh, surprises there. I think uh, the global accesses uh, it is just for completeness. Uh, I think that they are not so important at this level now. Uh, so I, I said that MCG uh, has some uh, uh, customization or customization. Uh, it adds uh, some extra uh, optimizations above the flushing. Because here for the illustration, uh, there are several types of the of the entries uh, that it tracks, and you see that there is depends on the configuration of the kernel. But it's, there is around uh, more than 100 of them. Those are uh, arrays that have to has, that have to be processed. That takes time. So what um, CG utilizes some kind of lazy flushing. So when the read request comes, uh, we don't flush it uh, necessarily, but we have some estimate of the error. And uh, if, if, if uh, we estimate the error is too big above a threshold, uh, we initiate the flush. Uh, so that comes uh, yeah, with, with the, uh, with the, uh, that comes uh, with the, uh, yeah, the results that we get uh, come with the possible error and uh, Currently, it, uh, here I have two formulas because it depends. Uh, the error can uh, be proportional to the uh, number of CPUs uh, times some constant, which we are just consider it a constant, uh, or uh, it uh, depends uh, on the asynchronous flushing period uh, times the activity of, of the of, of the writers. Uh, the CR stands here for the change rate, and uh, it's not not easy. It's well, it's not easy to combine these. Two into one, so I put that as the two formulas. Uh, the historical note is that uh, memory management code uh, needed the data collected even before the RSTAT, so it has it had its own implementation, uh, which was also affected by the error. The error was even bigger because it was proportional to the size of the subtree uh, and was causing the problems. And there were lots of C groups in the subtree. Uh, but the upside was that it was actually quicker because there is there was no flushing involved. Explicit flushing. Um, so now, now I will get to the part uh, where I had uh, my theory about uh, how this lazy flushing can be a problem. Uh, uh, there, here are two plots. Uh, uh, important note that uh, these are. This is not based on uh, real data. This is just basically a picture, hand drawn picture uh, to illustrate my theory. Uh, at the top, uh, we have uh, we have some diagram uh, for, for, of the flush work that it's being done when a reader initiates it. Uh, for uh, with the blue uh, blue crosses, uh, we. The blue courses represent the eager, eager flushing, which means which is not which actually happens. That would mean flushing every time, and it's uh, like the full amount of work. If we use the lazy flushes, uh, you see that they are mostly uh, just checking the error, and uh, only from time to time, when the error accumulates, there is the full flush work. That's and that's uh, visible at the bottom uh, where we have the error estimate. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the blue line, the error estimate grows, and then it drops after the flush, and the red line shows uh, that the error is always uh, very low. No, as I said, this is not real data. This is just uh, I used plotting software to draw a picture. Now, uh, then when I mm, was thinking about this, 
I thought that as we have more and more uh, uh, counters that are tracked for the MCG, we run into a problem with the amount of the flushing work. Uh, uh, initially, uh, the, the details are here in the linked email, but uh, I don't, we do not go into the details, but the idea was that the full flush work is proportional, uh, is proportional to the number of items that we are flushing uh, in the callback. And uh, here, uh, here's a mistake in the slides, actually. Uh, uh, the time to reach error estimate, here should be the frequency. Uh, frequency of reaching the error estimate is also proportional to the number of items. Here, what I mean is that the more, uh, because, because the error estimate is global, each item contributes to the error estimate. So if we add a new counter, it means that the uh, error estimate grows bigger if the counter is active. Uh, so uh, we, quick, we faster reach uh, the threshold error. And if we put these two, two together, so that would mean that adding new items uh, would mean that uh, the amortized or average uh, flush work would uh, scale quadratically. So uh, that looked like a, a, bit, a bit outlook to me. So uh, I wondered whether it really happens. So, uh, so uh, I prepared a measuring setup where instead of uh, inventing new counters, uh, because like uh, I had no use for, or the, 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 um, I would have to invent also the events that they would be counted. So instead I, used inverse approach where I was uh, reducing the number of existing counters. Uh, yeah, uh, big uh, uh, notice here that it's, this was an intrusive experiment as I was uh, hiding the counters, so I was affecting the behavior. Uh, but basically uh, I used uh, the mask variable and uh, uh, I I, I removed the uh, counters from the updates path and also from the flush path, so as if they were not existing. And uh, what was also yeah, and I run this experiment on the uh, multi CPU machine, of course, to uh, to see some uh, differences. And the workload I had uh, was a compilation of, uh, of a Linux kernel, and uh, in order to stress the reclaim path so that there is actually someone uh, asking for the statistics and acting based on them, uh, I applied a memory limit. The, and the memory limit was, was configured so that it's slightly less than the free running compilation requires so that the, there is uh, actually some need for the reclaim. Now, uh, what I saw with this. Uh, uh, um, I saw basically uh, the violet crosses, and you can see that they are mostly random. On the on the x-axis is uh, the number of uh, available counters, and on the y-axis is uh, the average flush time. So my my expectation was the dashed line that I could see some uh, increase in in the flush time, but actually if if I tried to do a real fit, so uh, it even went slightly down. But I think that this is not relevant because I think the data are quite noisy. So uh, I could not, I, with this workload and with this setup exper experimental setup, I could not see uh, the expectation of the quadratic dependency. So uh, that's a good on one hand. But uh, also it uh, uh, wonder, made me wonder what is wrong with the theory. Uh, yeah, here is the histo histogram of uh, durations of, of the flushes. Uh, so on the violet part, we can see uh, that it's uh, bimodal. Uh, the the lower the lower peak uh, are the quick flushes when we just check check uh, the error, and the second peak is uh, uh, is the full flush uh, that takes longer. But there is less of them. Uh, for the comparison, there is. Uh, data from just a single uh, counter enabled, and we can see that there are still some of the weak checks. Uh, but instead of uh, the, the second peak, 
got even longer. Like the expectation was that, and the expectation was that uh, uh, it should get actually shorter. But uh, so I will get. Uh, uh, I will try to explain it later. So, so, but on average, I think the time of the average flash didn't change, or it's within within the uh, very error. Here uh, is a th third projection or third look at the experiment, where here again I compare the variant with the lots of, lots of counters, the variant with less counters, and. Uh, there's the error estimate that's tracked in the MemCG code. Uh, well, so what caught my eye here is that it was this, uh, this error estimate uh, is uh, uh, counted in an atomic variable across all CPUs. And uh, recently there was a patch that uh, changed the, the way how we increment this variable that originally we would just increment the variable every time, and if it's above the threshold, we, uh, we initiated the flush. Uh, but uh, someone uh, have a quite a good idea that uh, we don't have to up update uh, this atomic variable if it's uh, already above the threshold. So it, it avoids uh, one more write of to the atomic variable. Uh, so, and I mentioned that this happened on the CPU with 48 CPUs. So. It's uh, surprising uh, to me, like, or it's first, at first it surprised me that at the top picture we can see that the value is quite often above uh, 48 CPUs. So it means that uh, uh, the individual updates are so big that they even if, with a single update we we pass the threshold, and the new condition does not uh, does not come into play. Yes, so uh, he, he, th th those are some results I got. Uh, I, I still don't have a good conclusion uh, why uh, why I didn't see the quadratic behavior. Uh, would I would need to perhaps add some more views into the system? So it was about the experiments. Uh, now. Uh, we get back to some real stuff. Or uh, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we're supposed to be next speaker right now. Next speaker. Okay, so I'm running out of time. So okay, uh, there were some optimizations, some uh, anti-optimizations, I would call them. And okay, so here is possible list of uh, topics for discussion if there is time for questions, or we can get in touch uh, elsewhere. Yeah, like this, there should be time for doing lunch afterwards, or people can use the matrix room to to ask any more any more questions there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.